In this video, let's talk about reader and writer lock. Reader and writer lock is yet another type of synchronization techniques to help with threads synchronization. We already talked about a regular lock, a monitor, a mutex. Why do we need a reader and writer lock? Let's talk about the reason behind that. A regular lock or monitor or mutex is always exclusive, which means that when a thread acquires a lock, only this particular thread has access to the shared resource within the critical section. However, in some cases, we want multiple threads to read the shared resource at the same time because reading doesn't cause any change. And when multiple threads are reading a shared resource at the same time, it wouldn't cause risk conditions. And if we use a regular lock, then the performance of the application will be hindered. So we look at this uh, application, for example, we have a shared resource over here. So this is the shared resource. And the application is a multi-threading application and we use different threads. So let's say this is a, a reader thread. I'm gonna use R in the circle to represent a reader thread. Okay. So it could be a reader thread and there could be multiple reader thread because um, we just need to read resource at the same time and make decisions. So multiple threads working together, we can uh, divide and conquer. So it would be a great idea to improve the performance with multiple reader threads. And there are other type of threads, which could be uh, writer threads, which is responsible for writing to the shared resource. Uh, writing includes making changes like deleting or update or add to the shared resource, right? So I'm just using W to include uh, all of those possibilities. And of course, there could be uh, reader and writer threads. So the thread could be reading and writing at the same time. So if we have these kind of situations, then we shouldn't just use a regular lock uh, or a monitor or a mutex because we should allow all of these readers work at the same time. That's why we need a special type of lock and that's what we call the reader and writer lock. So how does a reader and writer lock work? The reader and writer lock has to work in such a way that allows multiple readers to read the resource simultaneously. When one of the reader threads, for example, acquire the lock, other reader threads should be able to acquire the log at the same time okay, so that they can work simultaneously. However, when any of the reader threads is holding on to the log, the writer cannot actually do anything. Right? So the log is a shared log between the readers, but it's a exclusive log against the writers. Now, when a writer is holding a log, then that log is a absolute exclusive lock, which means any of the other threads, regardless of the types of the threads, cannot access the shared resource anymore. So this is the reader and writer lock. In reality, is there any possibilities that we use the reader and writer lock? Yes, we use them quite a lot. For example, in database systems, we have a database over here. Let's say this is Microsoft SQL Server. It doesn't really matter any type of database would have to implement similar mechanism for thread synchronization because a server is hosted on a, a central place and multiple applications across the internet should be able to access the database at the same time. The request sent to the SQL Server, each request is always independent. So to the SQL Server itself, these requests generates concurrent access to the server. So therefore, if there is a database table that, uh, that needs to be accessed by all of these different uh, applications, and each one of them can be reading and writing, or just read or just write, or read and write at the same time, then similar type of locks, reader, lock, reader and writer lock, should be applied, right? And if you have uh, worked with SQL Server before, you probably have heard of shared locks and exclusive locks. So when a select statement is executed, a shared lock is applied to a certain area of the table, right? So 
In SQL Server, the lock is more granular. There's rows you can lock, there's pages you can lock, there's different areas you can lock. Right? So select statement would generate a shared lock, whereas a update statement or insert statement or delete statement will generate exclusive lock. So a shared lock would be similar to the locks acquired by the readers, whereas the exclusive lock would be similar to the locks acquired by the writer. So this is a real world example where reader and writer lock needs to be used. Another example, it could be a web server, right? Let's say this is the web server and the web server can be accessed by uh, people from different places using their browsers. So let's say there are multiple users accessing the web server at the same time. So in order to improve the performance, the web server loads some configuration information into uh, the memory and stored globally in the cache. Use this rectangle to represent the shared cache, right? So this is a shared cache. And each time when the user sends a request to the web server and the web server needs to access the shared cache, there could be a reading and could be a writing possibility. So when all of them have different possibilities, whether it's reading or writing, then we encounter the same situation as this one. Why? That's because uh, in web server, usually when one request is sent to a web server, it's killed in the request queue as we have implemented uh, before, right? We have been simulating the web server with multi-threading programming. Although we just created a console application, but it's very similar concept, right? So the requests are queued and then the requests are distributed among different threads for handling the requests simultaneously. Because different requests could require reading or writing, therefore a similar type of lock needs to be in place. We need reader or writer lock to lock the shared resource, which is the shared cache. That will allow readers to read at the same time, but allow writers to gain exclusive access to the shared cache. This will guarantee the integrity of the shared resource. Same thing, this technique will guarantee the integrity of the data within the SQL Server database. So that's the theory. So now let's now let's take a look at one example that is uh, used for this particular scenario where we want to use a cache. And before we go into the code, I want to give some more information. So usually the configuration data could be stored in a file or could be stored in a database. Sometimes you may find that loading the configuration data from the database or from a file into a shared cache within the memory of the application, the web application, is a good idea. For example, if every request tends to access configuration data, then just load it into the memory, it would improve the performance a lot because it would decrease the number of round trips between the, the web server and the database, or from the web server to a file. Okay. You don't want to read and write all the time. Just, just put it into the cache and then eventually dump that cache into the file or back to the database. So it could be a good idea to, to load everything into the shared cache in this example, especially when there could be reading requests and there could be writing requests. Uh, then in that case, we should apply the reader and writer lock. So let's take a look at examples where we don't apply the reader and writer lock first and see what potentially could happen. So let's jump into Visual Studio, close this and try to close this solution. And let's create a new project and let's call this. So still select console application and let's call this reader writer lock. So if I create a class here, I'm going to call it public class global cache or call it global configuration cache then the purpose here is to just cache the key value pairs in the dictionary. So I'm going to create a uh, 
dictionary here with uh, an integer as a key and a string as the value. So the cache would be like this, and we're going to instantiate the instance here. Now we have a add method here that allows us to enter the key and value, okay, which to do generated code for me. And now for reading, we just use get and with the key, and here we just return it. So that's it. Quite simple. Maybe this could cause issues. So let's use a safer technique. So I'm going to say cache dot try get value. So we try to get value of this particular key out for uh, into the value variable. And if it's successful, then we're going to return this value variable okay, as the result. Otherwise, maybe we'll just return null instead of empty. So then here we can use a question mark. All right, so this looks like it's going to work quite well for our purpose. And indeed, if you try this in your web application, you might be using it no problems. But once in a while, there could be weird errors in consistent state. Why this is happening? Well, it's just really because that these requests that comes from different users comes to the web comes to the web server at the same time that is handled by different threads from a .NET thread pool. Right? So because it's handled by different threads, they can be running in parallel, simultaneously running in different core of the uh, CPU. Therefore, they might be accessing the dictionary at the same time. So there could be different threads reading and writing at the same time. And because the dictionary itself is not actually thread safe, right? we haven't talked about thread safety for uh, data structures. But the easy way to understand the thread safety problem is that this particular operation looks like one line of code. This one also looks like one line, one line of code. They're not really atomic. We talked about atomic operation before, right? So they're not really atomic. So if this is atomic, absolutely executed or not executed, then this implementation would have no problems. However, these are not atomic operations. So they are broken into different parts when the compiler compiles the code. So therefore, when multiple threads are running them, you might just run into inconsistent state against the dictionary because the dictionary itself handles the, the state within the data, data struct. Uh, therefore, when multiple threads are running at the same time and running with different parts of, of this uh, operation, it just could really mess up the state of this particular dictionary. And eventually, we're going to talk about concurrent data structures. Right? And there is a particular one that is called concurrent dictionary. If we use concurrent dictionary, then, then we don't actually need to do anything. But if we use a regular dictionary, then we have to use locks to protect it. But we can't use a regular lock like this. Right? We cannot use a lock like this. We cannot use a lock like this. Well, it's going to uh, compile. It doesn't complain. However, your reader threads will not be able to access the cache at the same time. And if your web server is quite popular, a lot of users are using it, then you might run into performance issues. So what's recommended is the reader and writer lock. And the syntax is quite similar to the mutex or the monitor. So let's try to use the reader and writer lock. So what we can do here is we can first of all declare a reader writer lock. It's better to use the slim version. So we create a new instance of this lock. And then when we are trying to do anything with it, let's say we're trying to add to it, we just say lock dot enter write lock. Because this is add. Okay? Add or update actually. So here it's doing add or update. Then in this case, we're entering into a write lock. So this is going to be the exclusive lock. And we don't need the curly braces. Let's delete them. And then here, we're going to say finally. Don't forget to exit. And then over here, we're going to do the same thing. 
So let's remove these the code and then we are going to say lock and this time we're going to say enter read lock. So this is going to be a shared lock between the readers. And then same thing here, we're going to put a try catch and we're going to say finally read lock. So when we are using the reader and writer lock this way, then when the web application is using them, we're going to allow different reader threads to just access the cache simultaneously, whereas it's going to always block the writer lock. And when the writer lock gains access, it's going to block any of other threads. So there's only just one thing that we need to pay attention here. What if this throws exception before it successfully gain or acquire the lock? Okay. So this throws exception without gaining or acquiring the lock, and then we still tries to exit the lock, then that could be potential issues. So for that, we can use a technique like this. So I'm going to say uh, lock acquired equals false at the beginning. Right? And if the line can be executed, so this line can be executed, that means we successfully acquired the lock. So we turn it into true. And then finally here, we are going to check whether the lock has been acquired or not. So I'm going to say if lock acquired, then we are going to exit the reader lock. So same technique can be applied here. Again, lock acquired, set to true over here. And if the lock is actually acquired, then we're going to exit the read lock. So this would be a threat safe global, global configuration cache that can be used within your web application that allows multiple readers and a unique writer in a given time. Okay, that's everything I want to cover in this video. If you have any questions, please let me know. If not, I will see you in the next one.